Um, so you have a long copper cylinder of diameter 2.0 centimeters. It's initially at uniform temperature of 100 Celsius. It's now exposed to an air stream of 20 with a heat transfer coefficient of 200 watt meters square Celsius. How long it will take for the copper to cool on an average temperature of 25? And you have the data for the copper, such as density, CP, and K value. So uh, solve for time, please. Right? Um, you determine first with the bias number if you can treat as a lump heat capacity approach or not. And remember, uh, you need to correct for the geometry, right? This bias number. So the, in this case, the S is R over two because we are dealing with a cylinder. You know the radius, you divide by two, and that would be your um, shape factor, right? Uh, then uh, you get the biot and you realize that it's 0 0.0025, that is less than 0 0.1. That means that you can model as a lump heat capacity approach. Uh, then knowing that you can model as a lump heat capacity approach, you can just use the equation. Remember, we went through two equations for lump heat capacity approach in the class, one to get the temperature at a certain time and one to get the time, right? So you are using the one um, with respect to time, right? And you can get T out of, air, out of the equation or the time that is 239 seconds or four minutes, around four minutes. You have white potatoes and with a K value and thermal density, terminal diffusivity, sorry, that are initially at a uniform temperature of 25 and have an average diameter of six. And they are to be called by refrigerated air at two Celsius flowing at a velocity of four meters per second. So you have all that in the drawing. The average heat transfer coefficient between the potatoes and the air is experimentally determined to be 19. Determine how long it will take for the center temperature to drop to six. Also determine if any part will be experienced chilling injury during this process. This so as you can see, the, pro the book uh, solution presents us both solutions. With the tables, right, where we read the biot from the biot numbers, the constants, like we saw the gold sphere problem or uh, here with transient charts or Hitler charts. So more or less the Fourier you should be able to read from your textbook is 0.75, right? And then you can get out of Fourier the time that is 5192 seconds or 1.44 hours. Then you can determine the surface temperature with the other Hitler chart, the surface temperature Hitler chart, right? And um, I don't have that solution here, but if you see with the equation, you should get more or less 4.4 Celsius. So that is what you got. Um, it says, which is above the range temperature for chilling injury for the potatoes, there are no parts of them will experience chilling injury during this cooling process. It says no injury, but anywhere in the problem statement, they uh, mark that the temperature for chilling injury uh, should, be, um, should be above the temperature of two, three to four, right? So I just want the number in that problem because it was not stated what is the limit for the potato to have a damage in the problem statement. That is something part here on the solution. Convection. Uh, before going uh, through all the equations to solve for the convective heat transfer coefficient, that is the main objective of this uh, chapter, number five, we are going to cover some um, basic knowledge that I'm sure you're already revising your fluid mechanics course. That is fluid viscosity, what is the boundary, velocity boundary layer, the Reynolds number, the laminar boundary layer, the thermal boundary layer, the nozzle number, the Prandt number, and something new would be the friction and heat transfer analogy. So we are using that knowledge from fluid mechanics, right, and blend that with heat transfer to get this analogy. So uh, we are going to review just uh, 
concepts that you already checked in previous courses. So uh, just as a reminder, what is convection? Convection is the mechanism by which thermal energy is transferred between a solid surface and a fluid moving over the surface, right? And how we describe convection using Newton's cooling law, right? Heat transfer rate equals convective heat transfer coefficient times the area, right? Times delta T all the time, hot minus cold. That as you can see in the equation I have in here, we have a hot wall and cold surroundings, right? Um, however, we need methods for calculate the H value, the convective heat transfer coefficient for several situations and geometries. Because up to now, I always give you the H value, right? But now it's gonna be your job to determine that H value depending on the fluid conditions and the geometry. So first of all, uh, we need to define that the H value or the convective uh, heat transfer coefficient depends on the type of the fluid, the flow condition, the flow rate, and the surface geometry. So as you can see, the H value or the convective heat transfer coefficient depends heavily on fluid mechanics, right? And we also said previously when we started this course that we can divide uh, convection in two, force convection and natural convection. And in force convection, we can divide it again in two external where the fluid flows over on top of the surface and internal when the fluid flows inside a surface, like for example, inside a duct, right? In air condition systems or inside a pipe. And also we have natural convection, right? Where difference happens because we have different densities, because we have different temperatures. So we have the presence or the existence of heat transfer by convection. So since the H value or the convective heat transfer coefficient depends heavily on fluid mechanics, we are going to do a very fast review of concepts of fluid mechanics. And the first one is the fluid viscosity. That I'm sure you solve hundreds of problems related to viscosity in your fluid mechanics course. So viscosity is the measure of a fluid resistance to flow, right? And we have the Newton's law of viscosity, where tau is the shear stress, and here you have the units. Nu is the dynamic viscosity, and du over dui is the velocity gradient. And I'm sure um, at that point you uh, you um, define or you observe that momentum is manifested as the shear stress, right? And that if you have a fluid in between sandwiched in between two plates, one stationary and one moving plate on top, you will see the presence or the development of a velocity gradient, right? And uh, I'm sure you also revise these boundary conditions to solve those equations, right? So um, you will have some kind of velocity profile like this between a stationary plate and a moving plate. And just as a reminder here, I put you the definition of kinematic viscosity, because in most of your tables in the back of your book, you have kinematic viscosity instead of dynamic viscosity. So kinematic viscosity, right, is just dynamic viscosity divided by density, right? So I just put that for um, as a reminder. So based on this profile, we have the development of a velocity boundary layer. And what is by definition the velocity boundary layer? Well, it's the region near the surface where the velocity increases from zero because we said that this plate is not going to move, right? Then what is the velocity of the first layer touching that plate? It's zero, right? That is one of the boundary layers. So increases from zero to the free stream value. So the velocity boundary layer is the region where the fluid can feel the effect from the wall, right? Until reaching obviously the free stream velocity. So based on that, um, we can uh, define then uh, how the fluid behaves uh, on top of a 
plate. We were evaluating plates, right? The fluid is moving on top of a plate. So we can define our fluid in three main regions, right? Depending on what? On the Reynolds number, right? So we can have a laminar region, right? And here you have the ranges of the Reynolds number for having that laminar uh, flow. That is a flow where you have smooth moving adjacent layers. That's why we call it laminar, because similar to a laminar, right? Then we can have, uh, if we increase the Reynolds number, right? Like you have in here in this little um, yellow box. If we increase a little bit the Reynolds number, we can have the transition region where disruption initiates. Finally, if we have very high run Reynolds number, we will reach the turbulent region uh, with random velocity fluctuations and the formation of eddies, right? So as you can see, we can um, define the behavior of the fluid within the boundary layer by using the Reynolds number. And I'm sure that you know this number by heart, right? It's something that we keep using in engineering. So it's a dimensionless number. I don't want to see Reynolds with units at this stage, okay? Uh, so density, free stream velocity, x, that is the distance, right? The distance from which we are evaluating from uh, the edge of the plate, the flow, um, and divided by the viscosity. And here is in terms of the kinematic viscosity. This is absolute or dynamic viscosity. This is kinematic viscosity. So you have there just as a reminder, the Reynolds number, and also here the different ranges for when we consider the transitions from one region to the other, from laminar through turbulence, right? Um, then we have um, the lam laminar boundary layer thickness, and I'm sure it might be also that you review in your fluid mechanics course. And this, this thickness of the laminar boundary layer is important because it helps us to determine where the effects of the viscosity are significant, right? Remember the boundary layer is that area where the fluid still experiences, right, the effect of the wall. So for laminar flow over a flat surface, the boundary layer thickness is function of the distance from the leading edge of the surface. So boundary layer thickness is this delta x distance from the leading edge, and this is the Reynolds, the Reynolds calculated at that distance. That's why we have this little x in here. Reynolds x because it's the Reynolds we calculate at that distance. So what we are going to do next is to solve a very simple problem to calculate the Reynolds, just to refresh the Reynolds, and um, to calculate the thickness of the boundary layer with this equation you have in here. So if you can, um, so we have air at uh, 20 Celsius and one atmosphere flows over a flat surface at a velocity of 1.2 meters per second for distances of 30 centimeters and 60 centimeters from the leading edge, calculate the Reynolds number and also the boundary layer thickness. And you need to get the kinematic viscosity. That might be everything you need because you have the free stream velocity, you have the X value, uh, you might need just to get the kinematic um, viscosity. So uh, you can look for it in your book or cancel or I can put it here for you. Mm -hmm. So symbol. Oh no, it's not in my symbols. So the kinematic viscosity and put I'm going to put that B because I don't find the 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 proper one is 15.89, 10 to the minus six meter square second. So 
So that would be the kinematic viscosity. I'm going to put the name here because I'm not using the right symbol. Kinematic viscosity. So get the Reynolds for each um, for each of the distances given, 30 and 60, and also get the boundary layers, the boundary layer thickness. So the kinematic viscosity of air, right, at 27 Celsius 300, I gave it to you. Uh, so then we can calculate the Reynolds number, right? At x equals 30 centimeters, that is the first value given, is free stream velocity times the x in meters, right, for homogeneity of unit, divided by kinematic viscosity is going to be 22,656. Um, Same thing we repeat with 60 centimeters, and we get 45,312. So both these Reynolds are less than five ten to the five. That is what we established in the little box I put there for you. So we conclude that at eight, that at x equals thirty and x equals sixty, we have laminar flow, right? And then we calculate the boundary layer thickness with the equation I gave to you. That is this equation, right? That is five times the x. We calculate first for x equals 30. Uh, we change to meters, uh, square root of the Reynolds. So that will give us a boundary layer thickness of 9.97 milli millimeters. Okay, I just changed the meters here to millimeters. And the same thing we repeat for 60 centimeters, and we get a boundary layer thickness of 14.6. And the next term is the thermal boundary layer. And the thermal boundary layer is similar to the velocity layer, right? It now in terms of energy or temperatures. Now this is the region near a surface in which a temperature gradient exists, right? And this is for the case, for example, when we have here cold, a cold fluid across a hot surface, right? How is going to be the temperature of this layer near the, the wall? the same as the wall, right? That's one of the common boundary layers we of the common boundaries we establish. So we have then the formation of a temperature gradient until the temperature of our fluid reaches the temperature of the free streams, right? So we will have the formation here of a thermal boundary layer because of that difference of temperature, a cold fluid moving across a hot surface. Right, so it's similar to the uh, velocity boundary layer concept, now just in terms of energy or temperature. Uh, another important uh, dimensionless parameter that we need to revise besides the Reynolds is the nozzle. So the Reynolds and the nozzles are going to be very important when evaluating convection. The nozzle number is a dimensionless number, just like the Reynolds. And it gives us a measure of the convective heat transfer at the surface. And if you look at the definition of the nozzle that I have in here, it looks a lot like the biot, right? However, just to remind you the difference, something we use a lot is that we said that the biot uh, use K for the solid and the nozzle use K for the fluid because we are evaluating a different, different uh, phenomena, right? So biot, K for the solid, Nozzle, okay, for the fluid. Uh, so physically, the nozzle can be interpreted as dimensional and temperature gradient at the surface. So a large nozzle would mean that we have large temperature gradient at the surface and would mean that we have high heat transfer by convection. So all that information you can get from the nozzle number, okay? Again, if you have a very large nozzle, that means that you have a large temperature gradient at the surface. And that would mean that you have a high heat transfer by convection. Very important in convection or when analyzing thermal properties of fluids, uh, for convection is that if the temperature difference between your solid surface and your fluid is very large, you need to use the film temperature. Again, because in convection we have a solid and it's exposed to a fluid, right? So if the difference of temperature between the solid and the fluid is very, very high, 
then you need to use the film temperature to read properties from the back of your book. Okay? So, and that we name the film temperature. So the film temperature is the average of the temperature between the wall and the free stream or the wall and the fluid. Okay, so that's, that's a definition that we will use a lot when solving problems 